But um, so today what we're going to do um, is really kind of hopefully generally walk you through what the, what the senior looks like, okay? Um, I know you guys have had seniors go through. Anybody else? This is the first senior. Um, okay, so it's a pretty scary but pretty awesome um, experience as a senior parent. Um, and, you know, if this is your first and you have more to come, take in a lot of it. Um, just know that year to year things change. So if you've had one go through, if you have some go through later, things change. Um, some things stay the same, some things change pretty drastically. We'll kind of try to highlight some of the changes so you guys are aware. Um, and then go over a few of the key processes that you'll need to know about some of the key application systems, some of the key deadlines, um, and just general practices that you guys will need to know helping your students. So I'm here to help your students, and we get started pretty quickly. Uh, probably not this week, but I'm, my goal is next week that I'll start sitting down with all of your students. Hello, Hello. come on in. Uh, find a seat anywhere, it doesn't matter where. Um, I'll be working with your seniors and making sure that, you, that they are kind of where they need to get started. Um, we'll get a list of their colleges that they're going to be applying to, with their jobs that they're interested in, and so that'll be a one-on-one -on -one meeting that I'll have with them. I typically like to do that with the student alone, uh, just because they are starting to become that adult, and I think that it gives them a vested interest, and a vested um, kind of investment into what they're working on. Um, if you guys prefer to be a part of that meeting, feel free to just book an appointment with me, though, uh, because when I meet with the students, I'll just call them out of class very shortly, and we'll spend about half hour kind of going through some of that stuff together with them. But if you guys do want to join that meeting, um, just know, book an appointment. I'll wait till that meeting to call them down. Okay. Um, so, a couple different things that I want to, want you guys to know. That you guys should all have my contact information. This is kind of a brief overview of what we're going to do today, um, or this morning. And so we'll, we'll highlight the basically there's three key application systems for four-year colleges. We'll also go into a little bit. Anybody here looking at two-year colleges? Just to, so I know kind of where we're at. I might, I might go through it a little bit um, just for the purpose of the recording so that people that are interested in it, I usually have a different night because that time frame is a little bit different um, than a four-year college application. That four-year application system really starts right now. Two-year applications typically start late, a little bit later in the fall and early spring, so we'll kind of, I usually try to hit this one hard and then we'll have another, another, light, another night later on if you guys know people that are interested in a community college or, or a trade school where we can get a little bit more in-depth in that. Um, I will, Feel free to take pictures of this. I will post it online as well um, and email it out with the recording. Um, but take notes if you guys need to. Don't worry. And don't, don't be afraid to ask questions as we're going. Um, there's for a small group. Um, so one thing that you guys need to know um, yeah, is um, so I had, I had a baby and it looked awesome this you know, summer. So my wife and I had a, had a child this summer. That literally, she went into labor two hours after. I finished my last day of work, so it was perfect timing. Um, he's two months old now. We just got back from a six hour car drive, oh. which actually went okay. Um, we were pleasantly surprised. He cried about 20 minutes out of the six hours. So. Um, but just so you get, it's, it's just important, I, I like to celebrate this, but I also want you guys to know there may be times this year where I, my wife cannot be the only one if he's sick um, or our day, daycare provider is sick or something like that that takes time off to be with him. So just so you guys know, I do have a baby at home now, so sometimes there might be times when you might have an appointment with me, when your, when your kid might have an appointment with me, and I might have to cancel it on short notice because he wakes up with a fever or something like that. So I'll try to do my best to make sure that I'm here, um, but I have to take care of my own child now too, so um, I have 407 kids now. Um, <laughs> so ultimately, that's his name's Joel, um, and he's born in June. Very but um, he's fun, he's a lot of good stuff. And just so you guys know too, um, our website, if you guys haven't, been on there, it did get redesigned, so I wanted to highlight a few places that you can, you can find some information. The main thing that, for me at least, um, that you'll probably be needing is underneath the programs menu at the top, that's where you'll find the counseling area now. So there's not a counseling menu that's directly on the home screen, so you have to go to the programs, and then the counseling says NTHS counseling, and then the registrar will also be fairly important for you guys this year, because you guys will need to be, um, your, well, more, more like your students will be needing to access their transcripts um, and other pieces of information for um, for college information and things like that. Okay, so that's that's where you get there. And then um, once you get on the counseling page, this is kind of the main screen. It looks it'll be updated on with this side throughout the year with different stuff. But this will be the general menu. A few things. So the three different um, areas of school counseling is uh, academic counseling, college and career, and then personal and social. So those are the three domains of school counseling. The ones that you guys hopefully will most likely be accessing are going to be the college and career counseling this year, and possibly the academic counseling. Social-emotional is also great. Hopefully your kids are happy and healthy, but 
um, the college or career area has a lot of stuff and just so you know a lot of the stuff didn't necessarily just automatically transfer over from the old website so I'm, I'm working on moving things over throughout the year so if you don't see something that you saw before or you're looking for just email me and let me know and I'll try to do that there um, appointments the second one down in case you guys are looking for that and then Naviance for your students um, is also the third link down okay um, the only last thing I'll mention here is this it's a second circle so it's counseling resources that is a great tool I upload a bunch of stuff I don't like it kind of helps prevent me sending even more emails I know I send a lot um, but uploading things there kind of just lets me have a basically a big shared Dropbox folder that has different grade levels. So I, seniors has a lot of good stuff. For example, I just uploaded the UC application guide for this year. So there's that's available on there, and basically you can just hop on there, download anything you guys want, and it'll always be available there, okay? Any questions so far? Is that how we do access the Naviance with parents? Yeah, so if you guys have your account set up with parents, then it's on there. Um, we can, hopefully this year going forward, I'll, I have to see what they're collecting with this new electronic registration piece. Um, but in the past, we haven't been able to automatically set up parent accounts. So if you have one, that's where you would access it. But if you don't have one, that's you would need to act. You need to email me. Typically, what most parents do is just sh their students will share it with you, and that's right. that's a perfectly you basically have exactly the same access. Yeah. The only difference is parents cannot go in and like submit college applications and like add colleges to their list and things like that. Um, so that kind of gives the students the control, but you have all the same research tools, all the same um, tools available to you. So either one of those works. If you guys want an account, just email me, and I'll give you a registration code over email. Um, so just a reminder, um, and just, you know, something that I think is really important because I think there's a lot of um, gray area between what parents think and what students think and what school people think regarding college applications and kind of how that works as a family. Obviously, your family's gonna take the route that you guys feel is best for your family, and there's no better way than that. However, these are just a few of my suggestions, okay? So parents, please let go, okay? It's something that your student is going to school for. Either you've gone to school, or, you know, yet you, you know that's, that's probably pretty far back in history. Um, but it's your student's opportunity to do this, all right? So please let them take the reins on this process, all right? There's a couple different reasons why. One because college app one, like the big one is, it's just a responsibility piece. You know, it's hard to, it, it, I would be a little nervous for them if a student, student's parents or a student's family did most of their work for their college applications and then said, yes, you're ready to go to college. I would say, well, are they really? Because they didn't do anything to get there. Okay, so ultimately guys, um, it's okay to let them flounder a little bit. Um, I would say, try to avoid having them make big major mistakes in that process, you know, like missing deadlines and stuff. Um, but I would never, I would never fill out any application for them. I would never hit submit for them. Just let them own that piece. Okay. But you, so basically, your guys' role is the cheerleader um, and the coach. Okay. Sometimes I think parents try to play the player though. So just make sure that you guys have that role correct. Um, another thing, it's also a very emotional year. Okay. You guys will get in fights. <laughs> um, you guys will get in arguments, and you guys will laugh, and you guys will, you know, have a, the whole range of emotions go through this year. Okay. From getting frustrated when she when your kid kids up till like um, you know midnight writing their essay the night before it's due um, to the end of the year where you're using a whole box of tissues as you drop them off at school okay so um, one big thing is try to separate the nuts and bolts all right try not to get emotional with the process piece all right um, save the emotion for the other important pieces all right so try to try to approach it um, you know, with a good problem solving attitude um, again support but do not do and then plan time to talk about college, okay? Again, don't wait until the week before applications are due to make that snap decision about what you do. Hopefully you guys have spent some time already um, looking at specific schools, looking at things um, that your students are looking at doing in college and after college. And if you haven't, start now. Don't wait until October, because that time is gonna fly, and as soon as they're there, they need to be rocking and rolling on their application, not making decisions about where they're going to apply. Doesn't mean they can't change their mind, but if they can get a few colleges nailed down, that's going to be beneficial to them, okay? Um, the other thing that I would tell you guys, just as a tip for parents, try to take your kid out, like, take him out to ice cream, take him out to coffee, okay? Try, don't always do this at home, okay? It's, it creates, sometimes it feels, for a student, it feels very intimidating talking to a parent. 
about college. Um, you guys might have very pointed questions. How much does it cost? How long are you going to be there? How far away is it? Okay, all those questions are very important, but sometimes you need to be on kind of a mutual, even ground. Okay, so going out to coffee, I say, dads, take your daughters out for a coffee date. You know, um, moms, take your sons out for, you know, go paintballing or something like that, and then halfway through, sit down and talk, and, and talk about what the plan is for college. It creates a less threatening environment for a student to really open up and look at what the real issue is. Because I've had students come to me in confidence and tell me, I don't even want to go to college. My parents want me to go to college. I want to be a welder. And they don't feel comfortable enough talking to their parents and telling them that because they think their parents will hate them for it. Okay, So be open-minded with this process. That doesn't mean that that student should be a welder, but you should at least listen and understand kind of the thought process behind it. Okay, So that's that's one thing. Students, I'm going to, you, know, you guys can read that. I'll go over that more with the students. But just so you know, they are the ones that do it. They should stay organized. Deadlines do matter. Not like here at Nortel High School where we kind of push deadlines a lot. I actually set deadlines early, usually because I know people tend to push the deadlines. And so test to test deadlines are usually um, a day early or so. So I know that there's always some that trickle in. Not so with college. Okay, so if it says 11.59, it's 11.59. And sometimes it's actually 11.59 Eastern, so always check the time zone. Okay, because it, sometimes it's not where the application system is. Sometimes it's where that server, the internet server is at. So check that. That actually caused a big issue last year, but I think we fixed it. All right. So for a four-year university, where do I apply? Okay. This is just a general rule of thumb. All right. And there's no hard and fast rule about how many numbers of schools you should be applying to. But it probably should not be just one. Okay. That would be my only hard and fast rule. One school is probably not enough. Um, now for the two-year colleges, there's not a. You don't need to apply to six or seven. Community colleges, they're not a, a competitive admissions environment, so they're going to be not at, it, you can pick whichever school you want to go to as long as it has your program, has you know housing if you need it, if it has um, in a location that you need. So that's typically what students look at for the two-year schools. And four-year schools, it is a competitive admissions process. So they are going to look over all of your students' application materials, transcripts, application, essays, personal statements, letter of recommendation. Okay? Those are all super important. Um, and you know, your students might be stressed out already, um, but they're going to get more stressed because you know you guys have all heard all of the, the horror stories of in college admissions these days. You know, but I'll tell you in kind of like a good sense of that, the horror stories that you really hear are about five percent of the schools. Okay, and there are five percent of the schools that ninety nine percent of our students and any student anywhere will not get into. Okay, so take that. Kind of with a grain of salt, all the you know the news reports and things like that. Okay, there are a lot of colleges that student you know there are six thousand plus colleges across the country at the two year and four year level, and there's more every year. Okay, so there we we tend to focus on like the top hundred um, and what we call the top. And it's not really the top. A, a lot of those schools, you know, are even better than say a number one ranked school for your student. Okay, that number one does not mean it's number one for you, okay? So just keep that in mind, too. Two reach schools, okay, if they have them, okay? A lot of times I, hear, I see people, oh, I, I have to have two reach schools. You don't have to, okay? That's only if you have them. So like, you know, say I want to apply to Stanford. That would be a reach school. That's a reach school statistically for anybody, okay? If I want to apply to Stanford, that's going to be one of my reach schools. Even if I'm a 4.5 GPA, you know, equestrian with a perfect SAT score, okay? That doesn't matter what that is, Stanford, Harvard, MIT, those guys, those are always reach schools for everybody, unless like your grandpa bought a building there. Um, so, but those schools can also kind of be that target school. Say your student's like, you know what, I don't really care about Stanford. I don't care about some of these, you know, big name, hoity-toity, um, kind of what what typical people might say is a, is a good school to get into. They, you know, they're looking more at the schools that fit their profile, and that's really what we're looking at, fitting their school profile of, um, their, G, their average GPA, does it, is it close to kind of what an average GPA for an admitted student is at that school, an average SAT score. They, they kind of run on the world of averages. Okay? So when you log on to Naviance, you can actually check, you can see. Many schools actually post that on their website too, but Naviance is a great place. If you search up a school, you can look up Cal Poly, they'll say average GPA is a 3.9 or whatever it is, and average SAT score combined is this, average ACT. And so you're kind of comparing the student 
to that overall average. All right? And that is one of the best ways to figure that piece out, is of how admissible you actually are. Does that mean like if you have a 3.8 and you want to apply to Stanford that you shouldn't? No, but that is going to be a reach school and the students really need to know that, okay? Because more likely than not, they're going to get a denied notice. That's just, there's, I mean, statistics are fighting against them there, okay? So having one or two of those reach schools is good. If you have five or six reach schools, that's not good, okay? Because you are placing statistics against you of not meeting Target schools are those schools that you can fit pretty well. All right. Um, another great indicator of kind of how admissible you might be or what the chances might be is, is looking at an admissions rate. Okay. If school has five, six, seven percent, that's pretty small. Okay. When they have fifty thousand applicants, you know, that's that's a pretty small number that you'd have to be pretty high up there or have some extraordinary story to, to make that work. So the target schools are gonna be if you're looking at kind of an admissions profile. More like 35, 40, 45%. Those schools are going to be the ones that are probably more likely to have that, that admit that those come back. And then a safe school, and I use safe lightly, because the one thing is no schools are ever safe um, in the four-year college environment. You might get a letter saying, hey, please, you know, we got your name from somewhere. Please submit your application. We'll waive the application fee. Doesn't matter, okay? They probably send that letter out to 50,000 students, okay? Um, but it makes kids feel good. It makes parents feel like, you know, my kid's in. They, you know, they're, they're even waving their application. And that's good, pat themselves on the back, but that is by no means a, a guaranteed admissions. So that's, that, a guaranteed admissions does not exist in the four-year college world. Um, even for athletics, like people can get an athletic scholarship, be recruited, they bomb their senior year, and they can get that year, okay? Um, all schools, Need to be their first choice schools, though. Okay, doesn't mean that they can't have a hierarchy. Of, I, you know, if I get into all of my schools, I'd like to go to this one and then this one and then this one. Um, but all schools, they should not say, "Well, I have five. I really need a safety school, so I guess I'll add, you know, Sacramento State or something like that." Just because it's close, not because they really care about going to Sacramento State, but because of, you know, I know I can get in. It's close. I know my parents can afford it. I'll just add it to them. That should not happen. Okay, that's not a good idea. Because Murphy's Law says they had six schools and that's the seventh school, they're going to get denied to all those other six and have to go to Sacramento State. Okay, So all schools should be schools that your student is interested in going in. They may have to think outside the box, though. Okay, If your son or daughter is a very picky student, they may have to open their mind a little bit and say, you know what, I might, you know, maybe I can get by at a, a state school or a private school or a school in the East Coast or something like that. Okay? Because sometimes people get so ingrained in these are the schools that I want to go to, and they might have that all four years of high school. Like these, this my, my dad went there, my mom went there. This is where I'm going. If they don't get in, sometimes it can be like a world crusher for them. And so having these that this list and have them really do the research, think outside that box, and find some schools that really fit their profile, and fit their interests. It's not just about the academics; it's also about the environment in that school. Okay, so what you'll see probably thrown around a lot online is nowadays especially is, is what they would call fit. Okay, we have, our goal is to find a good fit, an academic fit, a personal fit, a political fit, you know, a, a, an orientation fit. All these types of things really fit a student. And so a student might fit academically, but you know, if they're super liberal and they go to a super conservative campus, they're gonna be probably unhappy, no matter if they're pretty, you know, they, they are strong academically. Okay, so all those different attributes really need to be looked at. Frank, you have a question? Do schools come to you and ask you for uh, recommendations of students who might fit their school? Or? No. Um, so the only thing that we send um, proactively is with the UC campuses. So in, uh, at the end of junior year, we send the upcoming senior class. We send off our, um, well, technically our top, I believe, fifteen percent of GPAs in our class, and they they actually whittle it down. So what that does, that's that's something called eligibility local eligibility in local context, or ELC is the acronym that you'll see. And back in the day, it used to be a much a much stronger system where it kind of somewhat I'm just gonna start because it's gonna get loud. Um, a much more guaranteed.
guaranteed kind of program where you 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 in the you're, you're in the ELC program, you're going to be guaranteed a spot at one of our UC campuses. It is not a guarantee anymore. It's basically another factor. They actually use 12 different factors to determine admissions in the UCs, and that just adds a little bit more to a student's application profile that they were submitted for ELC. Um, but ultimately, it's based on their GPA. That's so it. Do yeah. we know if the student was? Um, put into that? So they likely brought home a form last year and had you guys sign it. Um, so it, it's, it's literally me spitting out a, a report, uploading their names. Um, you guys should get contacted though this year. If you haven't yet already, so check your PO box and your emails. They usually email probably a student, most likely. Um, and then they will, they'll just say you were submitted for ELC, I think. It doesn't, there's nothing you guys have to do about that program, and there's nothing that you guys can do if you were not. So ultimately, it's, it's just a, a straight, we upload the student's information that goes off to UCs, and that's that. Um, and so, so there's nothing that you guys really need to worry about one way or the other um, regarding it. Will that help with the process when you apply? Uh, like I said, it will be a part of. It'll be a contributing factor that they'll consider in an application review. Um, I would say it's not anything near like their personal statement, GPA. Well, if we don't put it on the application. They don't have that information. Yeah. So they have all the names. They know who it is. So there's not even a question, where, did, you, where you, did you qualify for ELC? Like the student has nothing to do with that process. You guys have nothing to do with it. It's really just us. And between us and UC, the best just sending that information along to them. Okay. Um, any questions about kind of that application list so far? Before we move on. Okay. And again, everybody's different. So some students might have more safety schools. Some students might have more good fit schools and more great schools. But you have to find that kind of, I like to look at the balance. The other thing that I'll mention before we really move on into some of the different systems is it's not just admissibility. So you guys probably are also worried about finances, um, which is something very important to be concerned about. Um, you also want to vary the different financial options as well. Okay, I would not necessarily suggest applying to all private schools um, or even all UCs or CSUs because kind of the backwards thing that we have in America, I like to call it reverse shopping, is that basically we go out and look for that car that we want before we even know how much it's gonna cost us. So we're gonna go out, we're gonna make a down payment, we're gonna go out, you know, submit all of our paperwork, and then they're gonna send us a bill. And we're like, oh, whoa, $50,000, I can't afford a $50,000 car. Um, so, so it's kind of a little bit backwards how they do it here in America. Um, Luckily this year they have made a change with the FAFSA to have it start a little bit earlier. We will have a FAFSA night. Um, I'll tell you the date. I can pull it up on my phone later. Um, in October, I think. Very early in October. That's when the FAFSA actually opens this year. So it's not what, not until January. It's now going to be opening October 1st for submitting. Um, and you'll likely not hear back numbers before you get an admissions decision, but you will not have to wait until like middle of April before you have to determine if you can afford to go to school. And have two weeks to place a you know thousand dollar deposit or whatever it is for your spot at that school. So you have you, the goal is that people will have more time to consider their financial options. Um, so a lot of that stuff is still coming out for us. So I'm pushing. I didn't. I decided I don't want to talk about that too much here tonight or today. Um, but we will have another event specifically about financial aid, scholarships, loans, grants, that kind of stuff coming in about a month. Um, I'll tell you the. I, I don't remember what the date is exactly. Um, to just look for that. Um, but varying that financial kind of um, landscape will be very, very important. Because, you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, and Frank, you were asking about it earlier, is some people think that state schools are the cheapest schools. And sticker price, that's true, okay? But just like anything, a house, a car, most people don't actually pay sticker price for that stuff, unless you live in Tahoe and you pay like 10 times sticker price for a house. <laughs> But um, one thing that people don't think about is, you know, this, fifth, this school that's, that kind of has a sticker price of, say, $50,000 a year. So remember, finances, we're talking a year. We're not talking four years, a year. Um, the sticker price says 50000 but they don't realize that they also have a $5 billion endowment where they can give money to students from. Where the UCs, they might have a sticker price of, say, you know, $20,000, something like that, plus room and board. Um, but you're only going to qualify for what you get on your FAFSA. You know, you might qualify at the UC, you might get a middle income, fam, you know, um, 
scholarship, you might get a blue and gold scholarship. But when it comes down to it, sometimes, not every time, so don't quote me if you guys, if your ears is different, but sometimes it actually is cheaper to go to that pricey private school than to go to a CSU or UC. Okay? Um, same thing with like two year schools. Sometimes two, people say, oh, two year schools are so cheap. But it really depends on your finances and your family's financial situation. Sometimes it can actually be cheaper to go to a four year college, like a CSU, than a two year school when you add up everything, room and board, books, financial aid package. Okay? So again, the whole financial aid picture is, is very family dependent, which is why it's a hard topic to really talk about because everybody's going to be in a different situation. But just know that um, you probably want to have them pick not all $50,000 schools because you might, that, you know, your, your finances might say, well, hey, we'll give you $10,000 and it's $40,000 a year for that school. Okay? When you're looking at finance for cost of college too, my general piece of advice is thirty-five dollars to $55,000 is not worth your undergraduate degree. Okay? That is graduate degree money. Okay? So it doesn't matter. I mean, going to Harvard and paying that full price doesn't make, it doesn't open that many doors as an undergraduate. When you go to law school, when you go to med school, that is when the money really pays off because they have those connections. People, people just want to know you have a degree when you graduate with your bachelor's degree. They want to know you have the basic skills to come in and learn from what they're going to teach you at that institution, that work place, that, um, that job that you're eventually going to get. Okay, so that's just my piece of my two cents there. Um, so. There's a lot of different types of applications. There's actually a new one this year that I'll highlight very shortly, but give you a very big disclaimer on. Um, the main ones that we're going to be seeing here are going to be the top one common application and the school specific application. So those are going to be typically your private schools or out of state schools. Common App has about 600 different schools that fall underneath it. It's a very great system if you guys have a couple different schools you're applying to. If you guys are going to have one school in the Common App, many times it's easier to do the school. They'll usually have their own separate application. Many times, if you only have one that's going through that system, it's usually easier to go through their own application. So that's just my two cents with the common app. Um, the bottom one is the, the third one that's really the most common, okay, the UC and CSU app. Those are gonna be our schools, school systems. And um, the nice thing about California is they've made it somewhat easy in that students don't have to fill out, you know, if they're gonna apply to three CSUs, they don't have to fill out three different applications. They fill out one application, they hit submit, they go back, they add the other school, they hit submit, they go back and hit submit, and they're done. CSU is literally the easiest application out there. Okay, it's super easy. Doesn't mean they shouldn't take their time and be careful, but a student that's pretty on it, has their transcript in front of them, they can probably get done in about 45 minutes with all of them, if they apply to 23 CSUs. Um, that's about how long that takes. UC's a little bit longer, they have um, what they now call personal insight questions, so there's a short answer questions they have to have prepared ahead of time, um, a few other pieces of information like you know community service, outside involvement is included in those applications, but it's uh, it's still very fairly simple and also a, so sometimes you'll hear people say common application, and so two distinct different types of common application. There's one with big C, big A, that is the common application, okay? UC and CSU applications are technically common applications, little c, little a. Okay, because you can apply to all, a bunch of different schools through one application. The UC also has that, so um, make it makes it very easy as well. So we'll talk a little bit more specifically about those. University of California. Um, so we have the nine campuses. Um, the application actually is open now, so students can actually get online, create their account, and start filling it in. They cannot submit until November first. Okay, so they can get all the way done, but they have to wait until November 1st to start submitting, um, and it's due November 30th. I would suggest having it in by Thanksgiving. It gives you guys plenty of time. Okay, so I've had students wait until 11 o'clock that night, and you know what happens at 11 o'clock on November 30th? Their servers crash. Why? Because everybody's trying to get on there. Mm -hmm. So don't do that. Guarantee you, if you wait, it's gonna happen to you. Okay, they try to, UCs try to solve that problem, CSUs as well, Pretty much any application out there that has a deadline, it's going to be slammed right before that deadline hits. Okay, so don't wait because they, they, the colleges do not care. Like they said, well, why did they would if you called and said, well, your computer crashed, it's not our fault. They're going to say, well, why did you wait so long? 
that's going to be their answer. So they're, they're pretty black and white in terms of whether you get it or not, and they don't really take a whole lot of excuses. Um, on, um, only app, online applications. Okay, so you just go to the website and apply, um, and that will start that process. All right, so you can actually they can get on there and start that now. Um, again, one application that's seventy dollars per canvas. Okay, so if you can apply to three or four different ones, seventy times three. Um, there are fee waivers for up to four schools if you qualify. Typically, if you're on free or reduced lunch at school, then you'll qualify for that, just like you would qualify for a SAT fee waiver. Um, so, but it will only cover four schools. So if you're going to apply to five, you get four for free, and one will be seventy dollars. Um, additional information is available there. I have to double check that link. Um, I didn't click it this time, um, but it should probably. It's usually the same. Um, test scores. So there's there's a process for test scores. All right. So we do not send test scores or transcripts. Well, we send transcripts, but not automatically. We do not send test scores. <coughs> um, so students actually have to order test scores to the schools themselves. UC makes it easy is that you order directly to one campus that you've applied to and it becomes available to all other campuses. Okay. Sorry, will you say that again? So, not that part. One. So, the, with test scores, the school does not right. store your test scores, we do not send it. Only the official test reporting service, so the ACT or the SAT, will send the test scores. So students have to go directly to the SAT website, directly to the ACT score manager to have your scores sent. So, sometimes, the, the, the confusing piece about that for some of our students is Naviets will sometimes have a tick mark that says, please send my test scores, and they think that it's been sent. It does not get sent. Okay? We do nothing with test scores other than look at them. Um, so that's, and then the other piece is, send it, if you're applying to a UC, send, it to, send your test scores. Don't order, they're like 11 or 12 bucks a piece. Don't send them to five UCs. Send them to one, and all of them will get access to that. Yes? With SAT or ACT, if your student has taken it more than once, do they automatically choose? Typically, yeah. So the, there's a couple different the things that <laughs> typically yeah, can you just send one? <laughs> so, you, so like if they're yes, to, an, to answer both of your questions, yes. Um, Hale, the, the one that, um, that I get that question a lot is, yeah. is can I only order my best score? Yeah. And my question would be why? So, so keep in mind, so the, the, the goal of an admissions team is not to disqualify students. Their goal is to best qualify students. So if your student had a mediocre score, a mediocre score, and then a rock star score, they're not going to care about these mediocre scores. They want to see this. They want to see what is your potential for achieving. Okay? So they don't care. And my, my thought process behind it is why are you going to take something away from them to help you then make a decision about your student? So you can. There's an available that you can do that if you like. Um, it's like 35 bucks a score report, so you can do selective score reporting. But I would highly not suggest it. A couple of different reasons why to answer your question is, when they get those score reports, yes, all of those scores will come on there. AP will come later typically, but the SAT will have all their SAT. Will never. They won't see any PSAT scores. Okay, so that that disappears. They don't, that is not a part of this process. But SAT scores, yes. Um, but what typically happens is you don't have bunch of app, you know, people sitting there like looking through them and be like, okay, here it goes. Those things get typically bigger schools, especially they get a big old data file from the College Board that has all their student information in there, and it goes through a computer system, and it's going to spit out typically. They're gonna, it's going to highlight their top scores, and sometimes they'll do what's called super score. They combine the piece of the score uh, that's the yeah. best, and that's why another reason why you do not want right. to maybe take away that, because right. if that school does super score, you might actually be hurting them more than helping them. Right. Um, but typically, the computer's gonna filter all that stuff out, and they're gonna give you their, they're gonna get what they need. So I would say, I would hate to see you hold something back that might help your student. It's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt them. So typically, when you order it, SAT spits out every test they've ever taken, mm -hmm. or every SAT yep. they've ever taken. It's not just one. You're not choosing like, oh, I want the score sent from. You can. The you can selectively 14. do that, and there's a fee for that. Uh -huh. But I, I would save your money. Is AP the books. same as well? That they like, even if you've taken them, they. So AP, you're gonna self report. So all, all, most applications are gonna have you self report first. So you're gonna enter oh. your SAT scores, you're gonna oh, enter okay. your ACT right. scores, enter your AP scores okay. on the application itself. Um, and actually, um, most of these state schools are not gonna necessarily need their SAT scores right away. It's usually much later. They go by self, they're self-reporting applications. So they self-report grades. 
UCs and CSUs will not receive transcripts until after they've graduated. Okay, so that's why it's very important to be accurate when you're reporting and to be honest when you're reporting. Because if you say, oh, I got an A, thinking it's going to help you, and you actually got a C, they will see that. Right. And it won't be until June, after they graduate, and they're going to get the boot in June and end up somewhere else. Okay, so ultimately, they self-report, so that's the same thing with their test scores. They're going to self-report that, and then they'll have to verify, basically verify those, just like with transcripts and grades, verify that later in the year, depending on the school system. So they'll have different deadlines um, for SAT scores, for transcripts, for letters, recommendations. So having a good calendar is very important. Good questions? I was, I was told that the IDs don't go to the colleges. Until later. Oh. So, But you, they have a spot in their application that you enter them. Okay. Yeah. And are, are you, um, is if they have a score that they don't want to report, is, again, is it best to? I would say so, because they're going to see my, again, my own personal, professional like opinion on this. Um, everyone's got a little different opinion out there. You can talk to someone that has a different opinion. But my opinion is that um, they see, they have, you've listed that that class as what you've taken. And if you don't list the score, they're going to say, well, this student didn't even try the test. Why would they not try the test? And even if you got a one, in my opinion, that says, hey, you know what? This student was willing to try it. They weren't th that successful on it, but they gave it a shot. Okay. And that's, you know, in the 10 minutes they have to look at your student's application, they might not even have that thought process go through their head, but it's, it's something that, you know, just think about. Um, but no, you don't have to, you know, on the application, you don't have to list every AP score that you've taken. Um, it's totally up to your guys' preference. Um, AP scores are typically not used for admissions. They're used for placement in the school itself once you're admitted. They, they'll see the AP class that you've taken, which is used for admissions and your grades there. Um, scores are fairly, you know, hopefully you've had a few passing scores in the classes that they've taken, but it's usually like the, the score reporting itself doesn't happen until July, typically, after you've been in. Okay. A couple different stats, and I don't want to necessarily scare you with these, but I want you guys to be realistic. Um, this is the last <laughs> year's fall 2016. Um, so as you can see, every campus except for Merced and Santa Cruz had over 50,000 applications. Um, in one year, and these are all undergraduates, um, and admitted just a fraction of those students. Right? Um, you know, and every year it seems like it fluctuates some. This year, actually, some of the admissions rates went up a little bit, just like we're talking like a percentage or two points, um, primarily because I think the UC system is getting a lot of flack for so-called admitting out-of-state students where they won't pay um, money. But um, ultimately, you know, you can see it goes anywhere from 17 and half percent to um, 73 percent so that's again that's looking at okay is my how is my student compared to students in our class and maybe students that they've admitted that's why looking at that's important um, you know if you really want to go to UC Merced is the place to be um, <laughs> it, and it's actually a very that? awesome campus not in the greatest part of California but when you're on campus and most students spend most of their time on campus when you're on campus it is like in the last 10 or 15 years brand new and they're always building brand new buildings. So if, they, if you want kind of the UC, the UC education, because it's different. UC is a research-based institution. CSU is a teaching-based institution. Uh, you'll probably have a closer kind of mix between CSU and UC, where you'll probably have some of your actual professors teaching your class and not a graduate assistant and not 300 kid you know, lectures. Um, that would be a big difference between like Mer Merced and Berkeley. Berkeley, you're going to have 300, 400 in lecture halls, you're going to have graduate assistants teaching classes instead of probably the big name professor that people are really going to that school for because they're doing research. That is their charge at that school is to do research. They teach on the site. Um, so just look at that. That's a very interesting thing. Um, UC website, like I said, the application guide is on that shared folder, so that might be something to have you and your student look through. Um, they do not need letter, letters of recommendation with a caveat. So there's no uncalled for letters of recommendation. Um, UC Berkeley has in the past asked for supplemental letters later um, in the process and they are saying that they will probably do the same thing this year but do not proactively send letters okay so don't send things without being asked they're going to ask for very specific things and one thing they do check is can you follow directions and so <laughs> sending things that you do not get asked for is a big red flag on that area that they can't you know you obviously didn't read what we were asking for and you're wasting our time these people are, you know, they have, literally they've had, we've, we've had 
one of my colleagues had a, had a student go through that was a senior last year go to Berkeley, and they've been trying all summer till now to solve a problem with their admissions department, and they have not even been able to get through. Their, their message literally says, please don't call us, send us an email, we'll get back to you in a month, or something along those lines. So just know that they're super, super busy, so try the easiest way to make that better for them is to follow their directions of what they actually need. Um, if they do require a letter of recommendation later, they will notify your student and that is when they should start that process, so I wouldn't worry about it right now. Um, their eligibility is, like I said, 12 different, um, what they call comprehensive review factors. Um, and these are just a few of them. They're all campus-based decisions, so the Academic Senate at each UC campus comes together, which is all their professors, all their deans, and everybody, and decide what their admissions priorities are gonna be for that year, okay? And so, um, these are just a few of them. Um, and you know, Berkeley might have A, A through G and GPA at the top, and, and UCLA might have SAT and their essays at the top. Okay, so it, there's not like a hierarchy of which is the most important thing here. It's again all based on that individual campus decision. But A through G coursework taken. Um, typically, they throw out non A through G coursework. There's not even a place to enter on their application. The same thing with, well, technically there is, but not in their kind of main academic coursework. They're going to look at their A through G, which is a specific set of courses that are approved by the UC and CSU system. That is what they're gonna be asking for directly. So things like PE, culinary in years past, they just recently got approved. So if they're taking it this year, it might play in there, but it's, it's not, a, it's not, it might even be better if they didn't do it A through G. Um, but ultimately, um, they'll have those spaces and they'll go through and literally they'll have the pull down the only options available to select are our A through G approved classes. So they'll literally tag which ones those are. There is a spot later on that says, do you have any extra you know, extra classes that you would like to report? That is where like, typically, I don't want to see students like adding every other class that they've taken. But if you've taken like, if you're interested in being um, uh, a nutritionist or something like that, and you've taken, you've taken culinary, or if you're interested in being an engineer and their engineer class wasn't approved that year for A through G, Ensure that there is a space you can write that in. Ensure that there because that shows what's called demonstrated interest. You show that you're interested in that subject in that field, and that's um, ultimately kind of helps that process along. It, it just gives them another thing to look at. And say, hey, this student actually has given this field a, a shot. We kind of know a little bit coming in, um, and that's that's a good thing to have too. Um, GPA again, only based on it's re, it's not going to be what you guys see in your transcripts. It is recalculated on that application. The closest thing when you're looking at a transcript to the GPA that they will probably see is going to be the weighted 10 through 12 um, academic GPA. That academic means it throws out PE and your non-academic classes. Um, 10 through 12, they don't actually include ninth grade in the GPA calculation at the CSU and UC, so it's really 10th and 11th grade because they don't have 12th grade either. Um, but keep in mind, it probably will not be exactly the same okay, because they actually set a maximum number of AP credits, so I believe it's eight semesters of AP bonus GPA credit. So that's the maximum amount of weighting they can get. So really that's gonna be four classes, four AP classes. Uh, after that, they don't add additional honors points for that. Okay. Um, that, that's to provide equity across schools. Some schools have 23 AP classes, some schools have four or none. Right. And so they match, so they cap that. Um, and But they will see your uncapped, they will see your capped, they will see your unweighted. GPA. So they use all those to kind of try to create a fair balance. Because a lot of people are like, well, how, how does our school compare against other schools? And my answer is they don't. Our students are never compared GPA-wise, um, class-wise against other students. They're compared against our students. Okay, So we are comparable against each other because that's really the only thing you can compare. A school of 2,500 kids is not comparable to a school of 300 kids. Um, the course offerings are different. The educational content is different. The challenge level, the rigor level is probably different. It's not very comparable. So the really only nationally normed comparable thing is those SAT scores, which is why they place a lot of weight on them. Because that's the only thing that can compare us, our students here at North Tall High School in this rural district to this urban district in Miami. Okay, Because they're essentially saying these are referenced and they can we can pull this back to this comparable data point and this student falls here, this student falls here, and it pulls away all this other stuff that really impacts kind of what they're doing at school. Um, other factors such as leadership, co-curriculars, community service. Again, um, community service, like I've told students, many schools will typically have 
30 hours a year required. We have 30 hours in four years. Um, so hopefully your student has done some more community service hours and documented it. Um, it doesn't mean they have to have some like fancy form, but they shouldn't just say, well, I volunteered for 100 hours here. You know, they should be able to prove it and have someone that can back it up if they ever got questioned on it. Um, because if someone said I did 1,000 hours, you better be sh they're going to call you on that one. Um, but it's just always good to have kind of proof that you've done this. This is why kind of we've talked about in the past of saving this information, adding it to a file so you can pull it out later so you can accurately reflect on your experiences. The last thing is personal insight questions. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll have to talk a little bit about that. But this is an example of the comprehensive review, and this is straight from the UC. So this is some of the things that um, they look for. And believe it or not, geographic location actually play, does play in a little bit. Um, just like with CSUs, they have um, each UC and CSU is charged with trying to enroll, um, if possible, students from their own local area, because that's their goal. They're, that's why there's so many CSUs, and that number of UCs is because they are to serve certain geographic areas. So that does play, I would say that's a very small, small, small part. Um, but all these different types of things um, you know, really play into it. This is the academic opportunities in California high schools. That's what I'm talking about, where they can't compare. If they look at what we have a school profile that you guys can hop online and read if you guys wanted to, that lists all of our AP classes, that lists all the different stuff about our school. So they read that and they say, okay, you know, this school had only four AP classes, but this student took all four of those AP classes. Whereas this school had 15 AP classes, they only took one. Okay, why is that? And so they'll look at that piece and say, okay, how, how, how is that student pursuing their education more than this student or vice versa? Um, personal insight questions, and this is a change this year. Um, it's actually a fairly good change. Um, this is all available online um, on the UC website, so when they start this, they can actually go to the website before even starting the application and look at the information about this. Um, they're gonna have eight questions to choose from, and they are short questions. Um, they're gonna have 350 words to write to each one of them. Okay, so they're only gonna pick four, um, so you don't have them write five, or three, four. Um, but they get to choose, and each one, and I literally had someone here from Davis come and talk to me, like they were sitting in my office for an hour and talking, we were hashing this out, trying to figure out some of this stuff. They don't care which one you answer. <coughs> There's no benefit to picking one over the other, okay? It's really what your student feels like they can best represent themselves with. What tells their story the best? Because, um, excuse me one second. Um, what, this tool does, and the essays on things like Common Application that does, it gives personal insight, well that's why we named it that, but it gives the schools a better understanding of who the student is as a person, off of paper, okay? And believe it or not, that is very important to schools. They're not just trying to build a class of strong academics, they're trying to build a campus and a culture, and so all of those things are super crucial to making sure that um, they can do that at their school that year. Um, because the people that they bring in, are gonna, they're gonna ebb and flow that campus culture, and that is actually a very important thing for them. Okay, so they wanna know, does your student like to start clubs? Do they like to be active in members, in leadership? Do they like, do they like to, um, are they artistic? What are they into, and what is their background? Do they overcome challenges? Do they, um, you know, do they show some sort of initiative in anything? Those are key things that they're gonna start wanting to see. Um, again, honesty is the best policy here. Do not fabricate, do not embellish. The best thing is to tell it like it is, but you do want to use good grammar, you, you know, write like a college student might write, um, and you, they can use like things like colorful, not like colorful language, that's the F word, but like, you know, colorful language, like um, the descriptive language, where, when they're talking about themselves. Okay, and it really should be about themselves. Don't, they shouldn't be writing about their mom who came over from Mexico. They should be writing about their experience from that, that process. All right, so they really want to know about them. Um, these are the eight ones, and again, uh, that's the website that you can actually download it at. Um, again, it's just on the how to apply, so if you guys go to the UC application, again, it's lower little link there, so you guys can always have access to this. Um, but they're really, they're really simple and really open-ended. Um, describe your favorite academic subject and explain how that how that has influenced you. Students can go anywhere with that. Okay, so 
the big thing is picking the ones, and that might actually be a very hard thing for students, is picking the right one. Um, just remember there is no right one, it's whatever one they feel the best for. That's not. They might want to write five or six of them, read them all, and pick the best four that they like the best after writing them. Um, in a couple weeks, I'm going to tell students this too. During RTI, I'm going to have an essay writing um, workshop with students so they can self select to come to that if they like. It's during our RTI period of, I think, two weeks from now or something. Um, so they can come, we'll go over this, we'll go over some of the common application questions, give them some tips. Um, again, it's very broad in general because every student's going to have a different experience and have a different approach to how they write. General tips, though, are student, never start a student's essay for them. They should always write at least a first draft. Do not provide any input that first draft, none. You should write about this, you should do this, none. Because you know what happens is your voice comes through in that essay, not theirs. So stay completely out of it, say, your job is to write the first draft. I will then review the first draft and offer, not necessarily even content advice, I would, I would look at how readable it is, um, if you guys have any type of grammar background, check for grammar errors. I always suggest they can make an appointment with me, have me review it, um, or just share the, share the thing with me, um, and I'll, I'll look at it. I typically look for content. I'm not a grammar expert, um, but I'll, I'll check for readability. I'll check for, hey, is this something that college people might like to read? Will this rep represent you well? And I always suggest asking an English teacher to review it as well. Because while they will tell you, we are not really concerned about the grammar and all that stuff, they are. If a student doesn't punctuate, if they can't capitalize, there's no way they're going to Berkeley, okay? Unless there's like some fancy schmancy like, and I would avoid this too, but fancy schmancy like thing that they're doing because of that. Um, where it's like, they, at the end of the response, they say, oh, I didn't pack, you know, punctuate because I was dyslexic when I was a little younger and I figured out how to do it and I would just avoid all those cutesy little things. Um, They don't have time to do that. Um, general interest, and this applies to any application, um, read, the, read the instructions and please read them again after that. Again, following instructions is the number one thing that they see right off the bat. Um, there are help and FAQ sections on each of these application systems, so please review that. Um, a lot of times people will revert to emailing the school directly immediately when they have a question or emailing me when they have a question, and then I'll be like, okay. And go look up and see where this is, and it's like on the home page. Um, and so they should always do their homework. Don't take the lazy way out and just email someone. I know that they're busy, but so are these people, so am I. So if they can take five minutes, look for their available help sections, because most likely they have had that question, thousands of other students have, and they have an answer for it. Um, they can call the admissions department at the college, and again, depending on the college, it might have a better response than others. Um, they can make an appointment with me, and then I'll have different RTI workshops throughout the year. Um, we do use an exact pass ranking system, and this is our last year that we'll be ranking students. Um, and we use a weighted A through G course GPA for grades 10 and 11, unless otherwise instructed for the UC application. Um, CSU, fairly similar, so we're going to kind of breeze a little bit through this one. Um, different timelines, so the application is open October 1st, so they cannot start that one yet. But the October 1st, November 30th window is when they can start finish and submit that application. So they can do that. However, once a student hits submit, there is no take backs, okay? So getting in, CSU, UC, getting in October 1st, November 1st is no better than getting in right before the deadline. There's literally no timeline for, it, it does not matter. They do not start reviewing applications when you submit them, they don't care. Submit them during that time period and you're good to go. So take the time, just make sure, I would not wait till the last day, give yourself a two or three day window at least before that deadline, but take the time to review it. Stuff changes, a class doesn't work out, you drop it, and then all of a sudden it becomes a hassle having to go back and change that later. So just be sure, triple check that. Um, again, online, only online, no paper applications. Um, one application for all 23 campuses and it's $55 per campus. I have some students say, well, what if I just applied all 23? I would say, I hope your parents would like writing checks. Um, you can, if you wanted to. Um, I would say that's not a good idea, but um, you know that's available to you, and it's actually fairly easy. It probably will take about two hours. Um, but you, I would say pick a few of them if you're gonna look at that CSU route. Um, 
the same app as this. App. Different app. So oh, the CSU Mentor is the website. So the oh, yeah. CSU and the UC are two different little lowercase CNA common apps. Um, but they are they do not talk to each other. They do not connect. Um, and then one other thing too about when I said there are no take backs. Once you have submitted an application to either the CSU or the UC, it no longer lives on that application. It now becomes a campus thing that you have to deal with on an individual campus basis. So say, for example, you were taking a Sierra College class or you were thinking about taking a Sierra College class and you didn't end up taking Sierra College class, but you've already submitted saying that I was. You can't go back to CSU Mentor and you apply to say nine schools. You now have to go through nine phone calls with each individual admissions department updating them about your application fee. Okay, so it's best to do that now because after after you hit submit, it gets disseminated to all of those different campuses that you're applying to. And then admissions comes from them, financial aid comes from each individual campus. It's not a centralized process at that point. Yeah. So this is also regarding the UC schools. Uh -huh. He has one application. Can a student actually apply to like one of the state schools under one major and a different state school mm -hmm. trying to get into a different major? So yep. it's actually the same application, but she fills it out differently. Yep. So when you go in there, it'll, it'll say, you know, what, what, because every school doesn't have the same majors. Right. Um, so you can go in and list any major that you'd like. Okay. Um, I would suggest, um, as your students are considering majors, <coughs> brings up a good topic that we'll just touch on briefly. Um, and it kind of ties into the last thing here. So um, just so you know, at CSUs and even in UCs, but CSUs you see it more particularly, there's something called impaction. Okay, what impaction means is the CSUs are bursting at the seams. And many of them, you know, it's kind of your more popular CSUs, your Cal Poly's, your San Diego States. Um, they, are, they have literally no, they are trying to actually reduce their enrollment with, they don't, they're not gonna like cancel the whole graduating class to, to let that go. But they do limit enrollment in certain majors. Cal Poly is campus-wide impacted and program impacted, meaning their whole campus, basically what it does is it ups the entrance requirements for those campuses. And then even more typically for specific majors. So you might want to, regarding majors, you might want to do a little research about what are the most impacted majors. For example, um, Cal Poly, engineering department, major impacted. Um, San Diego State, nursing, pretty much nursing everywhere, major impaction, okay? Um, and regarding the nursing piece, and there's a few other majors, so another thing that you might wanna look at too, because some people are like, oh, I'll just go in and declare and I'll transfer it later. So you want to make sure that you do your homework if you have a goal major in mind already, because for example, San Diego State's nursing program, you cannot do that. You have to declare on day one that you want to, um, when you apply, that you're gonna be going for that nursing program. You cannot take undeclared for two years and then transfer into a nursing program. So certain majors might have that stipulation and requirement. So you might just wanna, many times the best way to find that is actually going to that program's page on the school's website, reading a little bit about it, because they usually have information about their admissions process if there's, you know, typically a more specialized type of program. Um, but yeah, typically you're gonna be admitted primarily as a major so you're not, you're, or into a school. It kind of depends on how the schools are going to do it. So you'll, be, you'll, you'll see students typically apply, even undecided, like at um, UCSD. They'll apply to, okay, I'm going to apply undecided, but I'm going to apply to the School of Letters and Science or something like that, or the School of Mathematics or the School of Engineering. So you, you're still going to probably apply to a particular institution within that college. And you'll be able to pick and choose typically majors within those schools. Um, there's usually less crossover between like, hey, I want to undeclared engineering major, but I want to be a historian now. Um, there's a lot less, and usually probably the other direction. So you could probably <laughs> become a historian, no problem. Probably can't be a historian and then go become an engineering major. And you'll see that a lot. There's a lot of people, even when I was at Cal Poly, a lot of people would apply as an ag, ag business major, which is pretty easy to get into, um, and then try to transfer a year or two later into the engineering program. And they made it a huge nightmare to do that, to avoid, to make that, or and kind of affected everybody else because anybody trying to change majors it creates problems. So you know, you know if a student's un unsure, that's totally fine. If they are undecided, I'd rather have them be undecided and figure it out than apply somewhere like Cal Poly or other places that make them figure it out right, right away and hate it like I did. Okay, so it's better to be undecided and know that and be confident in your undecidedness. Um, then apply somewhere, 
figure out that you really don't like this, then you definitely know what you're getting yourself into. And then have to look at other places. I had to change schools to make that work. So that's just something regarding majors that you guys should all know about. Okay? Any questions about that? State University, that they don't, they don't uh, require um, letters of recommendation nope. or essays. Any essays or any special nope. essays? So CSU, like I said, is the easiest application you'll do, mm -hmm. uh, apart from probably a community college application. Um, but literally, you're going to go on there. They're going to you're going to type in your demographic information, name, social security number, all that stuff. You'll enter your classes off your transcript. You'll pick which campus you want to apply to. Answer a few more pretty basic questions and hit submit. That's pretty much it. There's no letters ever. You won't see letters. Um, no essays ever. You won't see essays. Um, well, I, I won't see that. Sometimes you might see. Uh, a specific department might email directly their applicants and say like, hey, we are like, we admit 20 people a year. We need you to write an essay of why you want to be here. But no, unless you are asked for that specifically, nothing. And and I, I have never seen that working, but I've heard of it happening in the past. So I would just say that generally, no letters, no recommendations. Oh, see, no, no essay, well, no personal. <laughs> um, so eligibility again is based on grades in your A through G courses and your college admissions exam um, results. And this is actually what they use, it's actually math. Um, they actually use what's called the eligibility index, or sometimes you'll see it called EI. And each school, and each this is where kind of impaction happens, because if a school is impacted, if a program's impacted, this eligibility index is going to be higher. So they actually raise the bar. They have a, a statewide eligibility in, uh, index, um, they have a campus-wide, and they have specific programs. And each one, you have to meet certain things to qualify for that. Um, so for most campuses, it's about 2,900. Um, that was probably last year's number. I don't know what it's at this year. They don't re necessarily release it, and I haven't been to it. They tell us at these conferences we go to, and I haven't been to in one yet, and it's pretty early still. Non-residents, if you live in Nevada, for example, the eligibility index is going to be higher, because again, their goal is to admit California residents. Um, but that's a rough thing. Again, you can probably try to find eligibility indexes online, but ultimately, again, Knowing your eligibility index will probably not tell you whether or not you're going to get in, but if you wanted to know, that's how they calculate it. All right. So again, most competitive schools: Cal Poly Long Beach and San Diego State. Their admission rates about somewhere be about one out of three typically will be admitted, and then least competitive, um, but still very strong. So like a lot of people actually are really surprised by Chico, Sonoma State, Humboldt in particular. Those three schools. Like we have a lot of students that. Um, Maybe are not very competitive for like Cal Poly, but they want to go to a four-year school. They go there, they rock it. It's like you know the campuses; they're much smaller. Typically, a smaller environment. Sonoma, Humboldt, in particular, is usually kind of a little bit more friendly to students from up here, um, just because of the environment that they're in. Um, don't you don't have to worry about Humboldt. Um, it's not as bad as some people might say in terms of like what the local choice of um, use is. Um, you know, you'll so so. You know, I think a lot of people see that too. Students see that, and parents see that. Oh, this school's a party school. This school's not a party school. Um, all schools are party schools if students want it to be. So your students going to have the choice whether or not they want to participate in that. When I went to Cal Poly. I didn't do the party scene. I thought it was stupid. A lot of people did. Um, so ultimately, it's what they choose to partake in, and so that's something that they need to know. Is is pretty much everything is accessible on every campus. Doesn't matter if it's a small liberal arts study school. <coughs> You'll probably hear about it at some point. So ultimately, it's about how your students are going to make decisions about how they use their time. I would have a very frank conversation that looks something like this. Hello, I'm not going to be paying for you to go get drunk. So please make sure that you're <laughs> using time wisely at college. And if they do, say, hey, guess what? You know, this is how much we're paying. We're paying half of that now. Okay. Um, the unfortunate thing is a little bit is, is you know, the federal government is going to say this is how much a parent needs to contribute each year. Um, and uh, you know, if you don't do that, the student will have to figure out ways to do that, which usually incurs large student debts from outside bank provide, you know, outside funding sources. Um, so just have that conversation though, and make your expectations known up front about what your expectation as someone who's paying for this education is. Um, and then they're gonna, you know, they're gonna be an adult, so they're gonna have to choose that if they do that or not, and they'll face consequences if they do or don't. Um, so as ACT scores, use the score manager um, as part of the CSU mentor. Send the SAT, um, you might want to write that code down. So um, it's a specific code when students are looking at um, 
where to send scores to. Um, they don't miss, they don't need to send it again to every school that they're applying to. If they're applying to seven CSUs, they don't need to send seven different scores. However, if they send a score to, to say Cal Poly, the other schools are not going to get it. Okay, it's different than the UCs. If they want all the schools to get it and send one score, they have to send it to the CSU me mentor campus. So when they look up schools, they'll look up San Jose State, San, whatever. They can type in CSU mentor or enter that code, and it's a separate, looks like a college on the list. Okay, if you send your scores there, that is how it gets disseminated to the other to the colleges in the CSU. Okay, so that that's a pretty important number. Um, always use the exact version of your name as listed on your birth certificate for all applications, um, any testing. So if you have a nickname, never use that because that's not what they're going to be admitting you by. And they might get a test score and this might say um, Chewy, and then it's Jose, and they're going to say, hey, there must be a Chewy living at this address and a Jose living at this, this address because we have two different scores. We didn't get an application from Chewy, but we got one from Jose. Oh, well. And they're not going to connect. They don't connect them together. They don't assume things. So make sure that the names match. Um, and it's, if you have younger kids, make sure that they actually are bubbling in there. You know, they bubble in correctly. That is a huge problem too. So just rush through and bubble in. Why is there a number seven in your name? That doesn't work. Um, so so just have them make sure they do that. Um, and then lastly, do not remember your courses. Okay. Oh, I remember I took this class. I think I'm pretty sure I got a B minus. Don't do that. You have access to Aries. You have a transcript on your screen. If you really need me to, I can print the transcript myself. But again, you have that, that same information at your fingertips on Aries. Go back and literally, as you're going through, plug it in. Okay, semester one, ninth grade. Semester two, ninth grade. So on and so forth. Plug in the courses and the grades exactly as you see them. Um, if you have any repeated courses, they do require original grades and the repeated grades to be submitted. So do not leave failed this semester and then I repeated it. Do not repeat, do not leave that one out. They will figure it out. They, all, they do allow for repeats and they will not consider that in their app, in their GPA calculation. However, they do need to see it. It is a requirement. So that's why also in our district we have a repeat policy that if they repeat it, the grade stays on there, but it's not calculated in the credits in the GPA. Um, let's see, private schools. And again, we'll start talking a little bit about common application time over here. We've got a little bit of time, not too much longer, really quick. Um, this kind of is a, this probably covers about 3,000 schools. Um, so there's a whole, you can probably find anything you wanted to find in here. Um, from all girls schools, all boys schools, to co-ed, to nature-based schools, um, to super conservative military type schools. Um, but all the deadlines are gonna vary pretty widely from anywhere um, mid-October to like April. So you can probably find deadlines at any time. There are different types of deadlines that are available, and each of those will have different requirements that go along with it, and some have benefits. We'll quickly go and review that in a second. Letters of recommendation are typically needed for private schools, um, especially on the Common App. Common App, you'll most typically see a counselor, so my recommendation, and then two teachers. Um, it's, it's kind of a general thing. Some might have one, some might have four. Um, on Naviance with the new system, it actually will not let them select more than they allow which they used to be able to, and they actually have to assign certain teachers to certain schools. So it actually cleans up the process a lot. Um, but that is something that I would have them get started on right away. Like I said, they're going to need a senior profile filled out before they come to see me or see a teacher. Um, if they come say, hey, Mr. Ring, can you please ask me, or please write me a letter of recommendation, I'm gonna say, do you have your senior profile? And they can say no and say, I'll start as soon as I can get that in my hands. Um, and just know, so there are popular teachers. Um, and teachers, sometimes teachers will do their best to write as many letters as they feasibly can, but sometimes teachers have a maximum. They might say, I'm gonna write 20 letters this year. Like I don't have time, I'm teaching six classes, like I don't have time to do this. Because many times they don't write it during, when they're teaching, they write it at home. Um, <coughs> where, you know, I might have 60 letters that I write a year, but I build that in typically to, I try to build that into my day as much as possible. So I write it here, where teachers typically are doing it at home. So students are really, asking a huge favor of teachers, and this is a huge piece that goes a long way for colleges. Okay? So they should be extra, extra appreciative. Cookies usually help, um, <laughs> or coffee if it's Miss J. Um, but that goes along with their application. The schools do read them. Um, if, if I'm ever unable to write a letter, and so no, no teacher is ever required to. 
this is not a requirement of any part of our jobs. So if a teacher says no or says I can't, you know, don't come banging down their door saying, oh, it's, you know, you have to, you're their teacher and so on. It's, it's not part of their job. Um, if I'm ever unable to write one, it's typically either a student get, didn't got, give me enough time to have a letter tomorrow. I say, I'm sorry, I can't do that by tomorrow. Um, typically, I'll do my best to try. But sometimes there's just not possibility to do that. Or two, I don't either know a student or I can't write them a strong review. If I can't write a strong review, I'm just going to say, I'm going to tell them I can't write you a strong review. Is there someone else that you might want to submit in my place? So I typically do that by only requirements. So like if, say, for example, I don't know your student very well, um, you know, if they just moved here this year or something like that, um, typically I don't have the best background of their, their schooling or their personality to see if they're going to fit that school. So sometimes I'll ask, hey, is there another counselor in the past that you've really gotten along with that knows who you are? Is there another teacher that you want to maybe ask that, that really knows you? My only requirement is one, that I get to read the letter. I'm not going to just blindly submit a letter in my place with my name on it. So I'm going to read it. And two, I typically will call that teacher. Okay, Because um, I've had situations just last year even where I, uh, uh, someone wrote a letter, said something about their activities at another school that they attended, didn't sound right to me. I called that school, found out that was not correct. So I'm like, there's no way I'm sending this. This is not representative of me. And so uh, ultimately, that's just the, the prerogative that I place on there. If I'm going to sign my name something, I want to make sure that it's accurate. Okay. Two weeks notice minimum. Okay. Obviously, emergencies come up, but sometimes your emergency is not my emergency. Um, so I require two weeks. Again, if I have time, I'm going to make it work. Okay, but I cannot promise after that two weeks um, kind of gets closer and closer. Teachers typically require two weeks no matter what. They're teaching classes all day. They usually can't bump, you know, bust out. It takes about an hour to write a, a good letter, sometimes a little bit more. Um, so that's, that's kind of the process there. We send a secondary, I said, well, I send a secondary school report. This is a common application tool that has all of their grades, their transcript to date. Um, those letter of recommendations that all goes along with it. And then a mid-year report for many of those schools, so they will see those mid-year grades in January. Right after that, I send all these to these common app schools. Um, and actually, I had a good question that I'll share with you guys from when I, I went into calculus the other day, and we were talking about you know, students taking calculus, and if that was a good fit for them, if they were like, they felt like you know that was the right thing, or if maybe they should look at statistics or something like that, um, because, uh, you know, we had a very large class, and we wanted to make sure that the students in there really knew what was coming down the pipe for them. Um, and one of the questions that actually came up was, well, will colleges see my grades from senior year? And so yes, at the very end of the year, so CSUs, UCs, again, they will not see your mid-year grades and your final grades until June. So I think the question was really, if I don't do well in AP Calculus, will that affect my admissions decision? And I will, my answer is, not immediately. So you might get admitted. Typically, you know, if you're an A and B student and you get a D or an F, that will come back in June and sometimes kind of revert that decision. So they're going to say, hey, you know, you told us that you were an A and B student based on your history. We were expecting A's and B's and you didn't hold up your side of the bargain. Okay, and that's the unfortunate thing about sending grades then, but that's how their system works. The common app schools, we do send them mid year, so they will be able to see kind of that first semester final grade. Progress reports are nothing to worry about. So they don't ever see that, but the, the January and June grades are what will follow that. Do you send the, those uh, mid-year reports and everything? You do that automatically, or the those ones? Yes. So anybody, years? anybody that has their application started at that mid-year report period that I've sent the first report for, um, I will go through and, and go through and do all the mid-year reports. Do they need to make an appointment with you and give you the list of schools they're applying to? Typically, no. So I'll have that on, they'll, they'll, like, Naviance will be a very big part of their year this year. Like, okay. that is a, we work very closely with that this year. Like, they have to keep their list updated because that's how I watch and manage it. Uh, Plus, that's, you know, basically, and I'll show you briefly, there's at the end of this, which I, when I, when I publish it, um, has some screenshots of Naviance of how they update it and where they go. Um, but they need to keep that updated. If they're on Common App, which the, this process is for, they actually link their common app to Naviance and it actually talks back and forth. So anytime they add a school to Naviance or to a common application, it gets added to their account here. So um, that's usually not the issue. It's usually like the CSUs and UCs that, you know, oh, I decided not to apply to this one and apply to this one. They need to go in there and change that. Um, 
A few things I'll just briefly go over. There's really two that I want to hi highlight here. Um, the big one, and, and I feel like we talked about this probably in June, but I want to highlight it again. Early decision. Okay. Big legal things here. Okay. So if you do not want to make a mistake, don't do early decision. Because basically what early decision is, and it, it does provide some benefit. So if your student is applying to one of these REACH schools and this is like their school, they have no doubts about it, you guys have an idea about how much it's going to cost, so you guys have been there possibly, early decision might be, the, might be a good place to, to apply because it can provide some extra incentive for the school to admit that student. However, when you apply early decision, you will be signing a legal contract saying, if this school admits me, I 100% will be attending in the fall. Okay? And if they don't, they have the legal ability, will they? I don't know. But they have the legal ability to come after you for tuition if you do not. Okay? So it is very important that you guys understand that the early decision timelines are usually very early in the year, sometimes October 15th, sometimes November 1st. Okay? So if they are still wavering on, I don't know, should I go to the East Coast or not? Should I go to the school or not? Early decision is probably not for you because you do not want the tail end of that to come back and bite you. Um, it is binding, that's the, the term that you'll get. Um, that's the only true binding agreement. So like the other agreements, restrictive early action, for example, you typically get to pick one school to go um, as restrictive early action, so it's, gonna, you'll, it's basically an honor system saying I'm not applying anywhere else early. Um, and typically once you guys get admitted on either of those, um, you have to, your, the agreement that you're also agreeing to is that you're going to withdraw all other applications immediately. So if they offer you admissions under REA or ED, you're going to go back <coughs> into your other application systems and say, sorry, we've accepted elsewhere. So that's kind of just something you need about those two. The other two, rolling admissions, they kind of process applications as they go through. That's going to be UNRS, Montana State. Um, regular decisions are your most typical. That's going to be your standard, okay, apply November 30th when you're with everybody else. Um, early action, sometimes, basically all that, there's not really a huge benefit to doing early action other than you typically will find out whether you get in early or not. But typically if you get do early action, you're not going to get put, you know, you, if you don't get in the first round of early action, most schools will not defer you to regular admissions. They Where? won't? Typically, no. Oh, so, so early so. action, no. These guys, many times. But again, very school dependent. So every school is going to look at that a little bit different. Um, depends on kind of their deadlines as well. So if they're you know two weeks apart or something like that, they probably won't roll you. If they're like you know early action is going to be middle you know November November first and regular is February first, they may roll you over because they might know how many people they have at that point. So look at your school. So that it, it's very school dependent. So if it's your reach school, then you shouldn't maybe do early action because they won't put you in the. It depends. Check your check oh. with the admissions. So every school has a different policy of what they do with people that apply early actions. I'm just giving you a warning that sometimes they don't. Um, and that's that's it. Any questions about these guys before we move on? We only have about five. This is just the common app. This is all schools. Of all staff. So every oh, okay. so so not all yeah. schools will have all of these types. Right. Um, but schools may have these types, and there are a few others floating out there as well. These are the main ones that you'll see. Okay. Um, common application again. 603 as of probably when I made this a couple weeks ago, um, as well as international schools. Uh, some schools have different supplemental forms, so just double check their website if they have it, as well as supplemental essays and other questions that they'll have as well as part of the common application. That's pretty hard to miss. Um, so your family connection. So students are able to list this area up here. It says add to this list. Under the colleges tab, it's the colleges I'm thinking about. They're probably gonna either, if they've used that tab, uh, these are my. This is my list of schools that I'm considering. They can transfer directly to an application list. <coughs> Oops. Um, there's the, on the page prior to this. There's a, a link that says colleges I'm applying to. That's really where most of the seniors are going to be living this year. They're probably not going to be thinking a whole lot. They're going to be doing a whole lot of applying. So they can add these schools directly to that list. Transfer them over there. There's a, a way to say add to my application list. But they can literally just go in there and add it. I can do that, you can do that as a parent. I can also see um, kind of if they rank which one they think might be their tops. It just gives me a better idea because when I meet with a student, when I meet with you guys, you guys come in and have questions, I can pull this up five minutes before you guys get in here 
review it, so I have to ask you guys every time. So I can see, okay, so I see, you know, um, UC San Diego is, is kind of a high, high priority for you. Did you know this? Like, let's look at your transcript with that in mind. Um, and so it just helped me kind of give a better idea about where that's at. So this is the big hairy monster uh, um, in the college admissions world this year. Um, so you'll, you'll, have any of you guys actually heard of this before? Yeah, I think I brought it up at this time. Yeah. I pulled this actually from the, the June slide, but I wanted to go over it one more time. Um, this is a new application that started in April, and they're live now. Um, and uh, I think there's some promise to it to a certain level. However, it is very much in its infancy. And so many public and private schools around the country are not actively supporting this. So I will not actively Attention. seek out there's students to apply to this. If your student wants to, please know that there's not a lot of information out there. I have almost no support that I can provide for this other than what's on their website, so please just do so carefully. The only three exceptions are this. If your student is going to apply to University of Washington, Seattle, University of Florida, or University of Maryland, those three schools, you have to use this system. Okay, so just know that. Apart from that, most other schools will have two or three other applications you can use. I would suggest using the Common App instead of this app. Okay. Um, it may change next year in terms of my recommendation behind it, but just it, there, I would hate to stake your student's call, collegiate future on a system that's untested. Okay, so that's just my two cents there. So I highly encourage Common App over this. Uh, community college, we'll kind of skip that, but this is the, the basic thing. The big thing about community college is just making a plan, knowing what you're coming in with because they are open enrollment. So you can have 50,000 kids at a community college and they might not have, have classes for 30,000 of them. Okay, so it's, it's all about making a plan. And if you're gonna transfer out of a community college, making that plan as well, working with that transfer advisor, working with their counselor at the community college to get you through that process. Um, same process has happened later. Um, again, their enrollment dates typically start in from early spring. So for example, if the student was looking at Sierra College, those, that school is going to typically um, have the application start in December or January, but enrollment actually starts in the spring before they actually enroll in the fall. So sometimes students are like, well, I'm gonna go to Sierra College in the fall. If they show up in the fall, they'll have classes, they might be out of luck. They might not get great classes at that, at that point. FAFSA and Dream Act still um, work for that, and they are, there is financial aid available. So if they're still thinking, again, look at how much it costs. Is there a state or national financial aid or federal financial aid available for those schools? Um, do they have other resources at that school that might be helpful? Um, a disabled student services um, program for maybe a student with a learning disability. Um, a sports team your, your student might like to play, um, whether that's intramural or um, you know, NCAA or NI2A or something like that, or NI, whatever the other one is. Uh, housing. So many times you might see when you apply or in early spring, keep an eye out for housing emails. Okay. Those typically happen very early. That many times they have an application process. You have to apply for things like dorms and some campuses. Um, placement office, do they have, you know, if you look at pre-med, many times they have associations or offices that work directly with pre-med for a lot of people. Um, try to visit. You know, if you're trying to pick between one or two schools and you've been admitted but you have some time to place the deposit, try to visit those schools. That might sway the idea one way or the other. Um, we're going to skip this. We'll get that later. Um, finally, deciding. Um, look at financial aid offers. Again, I would really encourage your student not to get super, super excited that they got, like, get, get excited, but not like go buy the sweatshirt, don't put the sticker on the car yet, all that stuff, because you probably have not gotten your financial aid award yet or, letter yet, and that will likely change, it could change your decision, whether or not that's your first choice or second choice. Okay, so wait until you've actually placed a deposit before you go buy the $50 sweater and the, you know, all that, that cool swag that you guys like, you know, they all wear around in the last month of school, you know, it's like 100 degrees outside. <laughs> um, there's a lot of prospective student events that happen in this or later spring and summertime, so keep an eye out for that. Those are welcome weeks. Those are going to be new student weeks, that parent weeks that you guys are invited to go visit. That is a huge time. Many times schools require those new student orientations that happen over the summertime. So if you guys are planning summer travel, um, sometimes they'll have that listed on their website. So just know that ahead of time. I wouldn't miss that. 
Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, don't deposit. Don't double deposit. Okay. Technically, you can. It's pretty shady though. And it's a pretty bad no-no in that world. So some people are like, well, I, I I want an extra month to decide. So I'm just gonna you know put two five hundred dollar deposits down. I'll just lose five hundred bucks for the one I never got to. Don't do that. It's bad. College people hate me for that. <laughs> Um, so don't do that because you know what they do is is once a student deposits that space is not available. If a student deposits somewhere else, they make that space available to someone on the wait list. They make it available, which might be your student. Okay, so please just share that with people. Don't double deposit. Just wait. If you guys don't know, just wait and do your best to make a decision. Okay, because it impacts other people other than you. Um, if you're waitlisted for colleges, okay, make sure that you find out what you need to know. To Maintain that active membership if you have to actively respond and say yes, I would like to be a member on that wait list And then also what you need to do to get off that wait list and when that time frame might be okay? um, So that's something just to keep in mind too if you're if you're put on a wait list um, And then also make sure that you have a place to go if you are not Offered a space on that wait list okay? um, So that is some place where if you are waitlisted you're not going to typically put, have to put a, a deposit down So deposit somewhere else and just know that there might be you might lose that later if you just if you do get off the wait list and go there. That is the only circumstance where I would say depositing elsewhere is a good idea. Is if you're on a wait list and that's going to be a choice school above the school that you're possibly going to go to after that. Okay, so these are all available. We're not going to go through all these. They're just pictures of different resources and stuff available. Do you guys have any questions? Um, for the letters of recommendation, I understand that. Is paper that you have to fill out to ask. But are you, by saying that the Naviance does a lot of this uh, letter of recommendation, mm -hmm. does that are you like is it something like scanning to Naviance once you get a letter? So yeah. So basically, your students. Pro here's the overall process, and I'll go over this with the students in depth more next week. Um, is basically so a student needs a letter of recommendation. So they find that out on their application, Common App, whatever, on their school's website. I need to I need to have two letters of recommendation for this school. Okay, who do I want to have? Thinking about, okay, this, this teacher will be a good, will represent me well. They know me in the classroom, they might know me personally. Um, these people will, will write me a strong letter, okay? If you have a teacher that you ne didn't get along with, but it's your subject that like you're going to, you might want to avoid that. That's not, I would say they probably wouldn't write you the strongest letter, even though they might have some demonstrated or demonstrable interest that you can show. Um, but basically you decide, okay, I need two letters. I'm gonna fill this out. Again, fill it out one time. They can come to the front office, make copies of it to disseminate to the teachers. And then the key piece is asking. So I can't tell you how many people come in and say, hey, Reem, I need a letter. And kind of toss it on my desk and I'll say, hey, you. That's not how it works. Yeah. And so ultimately, they you know, they, they just need to know that they, they need to ask and, and say, you know, Hey, Miss Miss J, you know, I, I'm thinking about applying to, to these schools. These schools re require letter re letter of recommendation. I really enjoyed my time in your class with you. I feel like you know we got along well. I learned a lot. Um, I was hoping that you might have some time in the next month or so to write me a letter of recommendation. And um, she'll say, hopefully, yes. I would love to write you a letter of recommendation and say, okay, okay. Well, here here you go, Mister. Here's my letter recommend or here's my senior profile. I've also attached my resume and a list of schools with their deadlines that I'm going to apply to. Okay, and I'll follow up with you if it's okay in about two weeks. That is the that is how teachers dream of being asked for a letter of recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> and again, again, the only way to make it better is to come with a, come with a Starbucks in hand as well. Um, so so ultimately that that is kind of what the process ideally would look like. Doesn't you know if they come in and have this and they ask politely, I'm not going to tell them no. Where's your resume? Something like that, but um, you know, if if it would be helpful, I would suggest attaching anything you think the student might like to add that would be helpful. I like the, and I think teachers like the list of schools with their deadlines as well, because you know if if they're and especially the schools that they're going to be asking for. If they're only asking a teacher for one school, but they have five others, they don't necessarily need to include the five others. Maybe highlighting the school that they're going to be needing that letter of recommendation for. Because if that one's not until January, but the other ones are. In, November, they might they probably don't need to have something come in right away for that teacher. Okay, so that's kind of the process there. They do need to follow up. So teachers, the good news is as long as the student 
typically um, submits their application by the deadline that the school sets out. Um, teachers and staff usually have a little bit of, of leeway. I mean, it's not going to be like a, a November 30th and they submit it in February type of leeway, but they, you know, if it's not in by November 30th, that's usually fine for a teacher. They usually have about a week or two to kind of get that in after the fact. And I, I, I go through and double check, so I'll be able, I see who's asked for what online. So I don't know necessarily the personal conversations, but they also have to go online and do the process of not else, in particular for the common application. So I can see who's requested which teachers, and if the teachers have submitted. If I see a deadline's coming up, or like it's you know getting to be a week or a week and a half past when the deadline's passed, I'll follow up with the teacher as well. Sometimes it's a confusion piece about, oh, I thought I submitted, I, and they didn't actually, or you know they were slammed with 30 other ones, and they're just now getting to it. So are they going to submit their request through Naviance? So they start with it. Yep, they start with in person. Right. So they, they go and ask in person. Uh, okay, okay. And then for common application, they have to follow these. So they're not going to like hand them a letter that the student's not going to upload it. Right. So they're the, doing it on their own. Right. So the teachers yeah. are going to take it, and they're going to follow. And the students are going to follow this. There, there's a new portal that they'll go and tick off. Okay, I want um, this teacher to write this, and uh -huh. there's a drop down. They'll pick the teacher, and uh -huh. the teacher will get an email and saying you're the request. Yes. So that's connected to Common Core. Common App. Yes. Common App. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. There's a lot of, a lot of common yeah. education right now. <laughs> but uh, say it was somebody outside, like a, a okay. soccer coach or yeah. something, and they're not yeah. TTUSD, would you scan it and give it, can they give it to you? So typically they're going to ask for, you know, if they have supplemental ones that they can submit, there's an uh, outside recommendation form directly through the common app. To, oh, okay. To, but oh, they okay. do, so like they're going to say we need one counselor and two, two teachers. Okay, right. So the teacher ones do need to be educated. Right. So you're okay. not going to want to submit a coach okay, for so a teacher right. unless they're both a coach and a teacher. Okay. Um, right. But they, you know, if they have, okay, we will, we have one counselor, two minimum teachers, but you can submit up to four. They can submit two teachers and, you know, supplement a third one from a coach, and that that will actually go through the common application. Right. So that, that only people that go through Navion, it's it's a little confusing. Um, I'll work with individual people that have that circumstance because that's fairly rare. Okay, Most sorry. people don't submit coaches okay. for college applications. I didn't know someone from the education community. Yeah, so so the left, they want to, they, you know, they're admitting you based on your academics, so they want to see how So if we got one school. last year, which we did from a teacher here, but it was for an outside scholarship thing, can that... Is the teacher still here? Yeah, can that teacher just, I don't know, cut yeah, and paste in some way to... Yeah, they could probably just spruce it up as long as okay. it's on the computer, spruce it up, change the date, okay. um, and that's fine, okay. as long as that's what... You know they want to do with their letter. I was um, just trying to think how. But yeah, that would make it e that would make it easy for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's definitely an yeah. option. I just didn't want to make it too hard. I just wouldn't. I just wouldn't plan on submitting a year old or two year old right. recommendation. Yeah. Um, so some of the schools um, are are now test optional. Uh -huh. Have you? Is that a good, 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 a good thing up. or a bad thing to not submit if they're test optional? So kind of a loaded question because there's not really a right answer. Um, so test optional, if, in case you guys don't know, test optional schools are basically saying we are not required, we have the ability to receive tests and include it in our admissions decision, or we have a way that students can apply without submitting test scores. So no SATs or ACTs. There's a lot of controversy regarding ACTs and SATs, especially in the last couple of years. How valid are they? Do they actually represent how well students would do in college? There's, some, there's arguments on both sides of that equation. However, test optional schools, what they're going to be looking for, so they will have a test optional way to apply. So they will not just, oh, I just want that. that's one less thing off my checklist. They typically add other things that they need mm -hmm. to review. It might be an extra essay. It might be something you know, something else, a piece of work that they've done in school. It really depends. So test optional schools typically are going to be, it, that's going to be a very broad category of schools, and they're going to have a broad category of different things they might want. Have you seen any data that hurts students' eligibility nope. to be accepted? Nope. Okay. They all say we compare them just the same. It's hard, you know. I don't know how that works exactly. Yeah. So I mean, if, you know, a student has this essay and a student has this test score, how do you compare them? But they have a system in place to be able to do so. So ultimately, um, it's kind of up to you what they feel like is the best way to, way to go. If they're not super confident in their test scores, but they are confident in their academics and they're confident in their essays, you know, I would say the, the weighting kind of goes a little bit more towards the essays than, um, and things like that, how they represent themselves on their application um, with the test optional versus the with the test scores included, um, but it's it's a it's a really tough one to answer because yeah. there there's not really a hard and fast black and white rule. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Otherwise, we are done. Yes? It kind of has to do with the thing going on on Thursday. Okay. It said it was really for students, but it would be a good 